and <laughs> your hair too I love it like yes oh yeah. thanks really. thanks really, really good thanks yeah I was just needing I was in need of braids that didn't take two days to do <laughs> <laughs> yes my braids took 10 hours 10 and a half hours I was it's sure. awful because yes. you're doing it yourself and you know it's going to take like a good 12 yes. hours and you could just sit down in the salon and be out of there mm-hmm. in four stings mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah I, I need to I don't really braid my own hair my sister sometimes braids it for me so I'm actually gonna have to just level up and do my own <laughs> twists <laughs> it's like it's time it's time you grow up and learn how to cane row it's getting embarrassing <laughs> Yeah, I feel you on that one. I definitely feel you. Yeah, I cannot really. My sister knows how to do ev- My baby sister, who's 10 years younger than me, like makeup, mm. hair, dress. I'm like, why didn't I get these? They came oh. into a different world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm. Maya's the one who put me onto all my YouTube tutorials. I'm making sure that my Telfar bag is visible in the background. <laughs> 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 no, that's socially unacceptable, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, y'all. I'm about to broadcast live so folks can come in. Um okay, yeah, cool. I'll just keep talking. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm so jealous about that bag. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, on that um braiding and the younger mm-hmm. folk, my little sister who's 14 has been braiding her hair for a good year now. She just turned yes. to me one day, she's like, I'm just gonna learn. And she did it, and she did, and it. She did it. And they're pretty she good. Just a few YouTube tutorials and just mm-hmm. banged it out, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. No, my sister's Creativity. 21, 22 at Christmas. Okay. And she can just do everything. Everything I can't do, she can do. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, and does it 10 times. Then my sister had the nerve to say to me, like I'm like really much older than her. Like, do you know who Destiny's Child is? And I'm like, <laughs> shut <laughs> up! <laughs> I don't know who Destiny's Child is. I was like, Ooh. oh my goodness, <laughs> the disrespect. Hey, did she her. not know? Did she not know, or did she think you didn't know? No, she knew. She was listening to like bills, 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 and was like, one like. Do you know who Destiny's Child is? I was like, hold on, like this is, you know, I was born before you. Like this is not but disrespect. <laughs> exactly. Like, do you think you're teaching me disrespectful. something? Yeah. No, that's awful. That's just... my, my sister started singing um, Sierra Get Up, and I was finishing the rest of the song that she didn't know the lyrics to, and then she was like, How do you know that TikTok song? I was just like, that I'm so, song. I'm so offended. <laughs> Listen, just, ah. you. yes, it's really a mess out here. Really a mess. Hey, wow, look at everyone coming in. Um, wow, oh, wow, yeah. that's a lot of participants already. Hello, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, we're super excited for you to be here. Um, yeah, this is great. This is really, really great. So, I'm gonna get started, y'all. Um, we've been laughing about hair, everything. Um, Brianna's amazing bag that I'm jealous about right now. Um, but yes, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so jealous though. But um, hi everyone, hope you're doing well. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Jamie Swift. I'm the executive director of Black and Radicals and I'm really, really excited for this event today on the digital lives of Black women in Britain featuring three amazing powerhouse intellectuals, organizers, activists, academics, uh, Francesca Soban, Keisha Bruce, and Rihanna Walcott. Walcott. So thank you for joining us. Um, But before we get started, if you've joined our events before, you know that I like to establish a space and recognize that this is a safe space, right? So we don't accept any transphobia, homophobia, queerphobia, massage and war racism, We don't accept, and more, we don't accept those things. So if you can't abide by those rules of the safe space, then I will have to kick you out. Um, So it's just as a kind but firm reminder about that. But also too, if you don't mind um, dropping your name, your pronouns, and where you're from in the group chat, um, just to see where everyone's from and who's joining us. So thank you for doing that as well. But 
I'm about to introduce our amazing, amazing panelists. Um, I'm so excited for this conversation and just hearing about the amazing work that they do. So let's get into their bios. So first off, we have Dr. Francesca Soban, who is a lecturer in digital media studies at the School of Journalism, Media and Culture at Cardiff University. She is a course director of the BA Media, Journalism and Culture program and is an affiliate of the D Data Justice Lab. Francesca's work focuses on digital culture, Black diaspora and feminism, creative work and the experiences of Black women. She is the author of The Digital Lives of Black Women in Britain and is co-editor with Professor Akwugu Imijulu of To Exist is to Resist, Black Feminism in Europe. Francesca tweets at Chess S and you can learn more about her work at francescasoban.com. So thank you so much, Francesca, for being here. Thank you for having me. Next up, we have Rihanna Walcott, who is an LAHP funded PhD candidate at King's College London, researching Black women's identity formation in digital spaces, and a graduate twice over from the University of Edinburgh. She co-founded Project uh, myopia.com, a website that promotes inclusivity in academia and a decolonized curriculum. She frequently writes about feminism, mental health, race, and literature for publications including Galdem, The Skinny, The Welcome Collection, The Metro, The Guardian, The BBC, Vice, and Days. Rihanna is co-editor of an anthology about BAME mental health, The Color of Madness, and in the time left over, she moonlights as a professional jazz singer. Well, excuse me, Rihanna. Wow. Um, Rihanna tweets at Rihanna Walcott, and you can learn more about her work at RihannaWalcott.com. So thank you so much, Rihanna. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I didn't know you were a professional. Excuse me, you just do everything. So, um, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> part time, you know. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, we have the wonderful Keisha Bruce who is a Midland Four Cities funded PhD researcher in Black Studies at the University of Nottingham. Her research interests include Black popular culture, diasporic visual cultures, and digital media representations. Her PhD thesis explores Black women's digital visual cultures on social media with a particular focus on how identity is mediated and a diasporic community is fostered online through processes of visuality and effect. Outside of her thesis, she is currently undergoing an archiving project on Black girlhood in Britain. You can find her on Twitter at Keisha Tweets. So thank you so much for joining us um, once again. And I just really wanna hop into the questions or like the first theme of the discussion, which is exploring the digital lives of Black women in Britain. So I'm curious what motivated you to explore and conduct research on Black women in Britain and their engagement with digital spaces and digital publics? And how has your research impacted you personally and politically? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, so for me, it was really about um, embracing, honoring and celebrating the online communities that I was a part of and I've been a part of growing up. And that's really where, um, that's where the motivation was um, like pulling me towards that. Just like Keisha, I'd you know, spent so much time living in these specific places online and they'd done so much for me as um, a university student in a predominantly West and I kind of noticed like how much leaning on certain Facebook spaces back when that was a thing. And then also how much I was leaning on Twitter and it was just really interesting in the way that we spoke inside those spaces, like how we spoke when we were just in communities of us with ourselves versus how we spoke when we knew we were being observed by a potential white And just wanting to sort of center like I do think of like my work to like as I've letter to all of those spaces that yeah and I think for me initially what what I was really interested in was different experiences um regarding black women's creation of media and what they were watching on television how they felt they were or weren't depicted in the media in Britain 
and in particular as part of my work I I, I like to to be in conversation with different black women in, in different parts of Britain as well so I'm really interested in how different regions and sort of the internal political dynamics within Britain and in particular devolved nations and um, factor into the different ways people do or don't feel they're able to access opportunities in the media industry or see themselves depicted on screen. Um, but I think when I started out doing some of my own work in 2015, what was really clear was just how many black women, including myself, were turning to digital spaces, going online to create content themselves, curate content and to, to really find stuff that was lacking in terms of the mainstream media landscape in Britain. Yes, thank you so much for sharing all that. I think that's so important actually to ground the discussion, but I'm also curious, a follow-up to that is that we are all globally, COVID-19 has impacted everyone, obviously. And I'm just interested how COVID-19 has impacted like the digital lives and the landscape of Black women in Britain and how they're using digital publics and digital spaces. Yes, yeah, so I'll maybe hop in with something briefly. I, I think, I'm probably stating the obvious. I know it's nothing new to, to any of us here and to many if not everybody who is listening to this conversation, but something that I've been really aware of is just how the push to be sort of always online, to be hyper visible, to be making use of digital spaces as part of different aspects of people's lives that they might not previously have been doing is, is really you know, exacerbating a lot of the forms of online abuse and harm that we know black women have experienced for a very long time. So I think when it came to working on my project and sort of the final few months of writing up my book, I was really conscious of how employers and um, educational institutions, different public services and governments are really, you know, trying to, to force people to be online in ways that can compromise their safety and can also be at odds with their privacy and the ways they live their lives. So something I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, who does or doesn't have access to digital technology and to these digital spaces? And even if they do, how are those experiences enriching their lives? Because more often than not, I feel as though it comes at a real cost. Um, so with my work, autoethnography is um, quite a big aspect of that. So I'm interested in, um, different projects that um, Black women undertake online, but I'm also interested in um, how I found them and how I interact with these different um, forms of visual media online. And during COVID, obviously, and um, bouncing off what Francesca said, a lot of people, well, we had no choice but to turn to centre our lives around the digital. And I think that, and I wonder whether this was similar for you as well, Rihanna, and Chester, actually, like it posed quite, um, a difficult situation for me because I was having to not only turn to more digital media myself in order to I guess keep myself sane and keep myself connected but also have to kind of um, I guess still conduct research within these spaces and spaces that I needed for um, my sense of um, my sense of self my um, connection with other people and I think that was quite tricky having to kind of just do a really delicate balancing act, um, which with your previous question on how that, how doing the research impacts personally, it's definitely fueled like a little social media addiction for me <laughs> that I'm gonna have to definitely work through. Um, but yeah, I wondered whether that was similar for either of you two as well. I definitely felt that, I mean, I'm, particularly like that thing about how it became all consuming you were online all the time and that was both a positive that bit right at the beginning where we were all on zoom constantly and all having netflix parties and things like that and that in some ways was like really interesting to see everyone go this mode communication i was like oh my god i must write this down every game it was tricky and it can be tricky when you're doing an autoethnographic project like Isha and I are to um, just you need to document every step of it. Um, so that's something I've been sort of worth grappling with, but also really um, seems kind of minor now, but it's kind of quite a lot. I really, really was interested in how 
speaking online in certain groups translates to the offline. So what I really wanted to do was get groups, rooms full of people to talk in these focus groups and also be conducting both discourse analysis online of how they spoke, but also offline. And that has is less of a possibility now because I think there's certainly some way in which we are, even in a different like this, where we've got four black women chatting, but we there is a it's it's mediated in a sense by this sort of digital screen here and you can't all speak once there's no overlapping you don't do all of the really natural patterns that comes to a group of black women in a room together and that was something i was really interested in seeing that like, like sort of trying to figure out how to replace that gap yeah i think that talking about us um yeah, talking about the way we use those spaces and what it meant for us to use them and need them at the same time as like studying them was quite difficult. Definitely. Um, and I hope people got that. I'm sorry, Rihanna, you keep going in and out a little bit. So excuse everyone, anyone for, if you can't hear technical difficulties from us, we're doing the, the best that we can. But everything that y'all said was really important and powerful, um, particularly about, you know, the over like being online and the oversaturation of being online and um, who has access to the digital space. Um, and so there's definitely um, comparative analysis that to that of in the in the United States as well, most definitely and going into the next section, um, which are the next theme um, of black women in Britain and black feminine and the black feminist tradition. Um, the what I wanted to focus on is like why is it so critical to center the digital experiences of Black women um, in the context that you're in, and also in your opinion, how can we examine the power of Black women in Britain's digital knowledge productions and community as a part of the Black feminist tradition? Yeah, I I think. I mean, we, we wouldn't be here today if, if we weren't pretty confident that black women's digital experiences and, and what they're doing in digital spaces are incredibly vital. And I think for me, one of the reasons why it's really important to recognize that in Britain and elsewhere is because, you know, of, of course, digital spaces and digital technology is, um, you know, there are many limitations there. Oftentimes platforms are created by people who definitely don't have black women's interests in mind, but there are certain opportunities for a black women to create work and collaborate and do things in a way that might afford them a bit more autonomy than other contexts or when having to, to work with or through certain institutions. So I think we do see really clear examples of what might be regarded as the democratization of knowledge production, black women doing incredible theorizing and critical work and black feminist knowledge production online and doing this work in ways that is often ignored and erased by academic institutions and different organizations that tend to be watching and seeing what's going on there, but refusing to recognize it in the way that it should be recognized. And I think the, the other thing I just wanted to add at this point was, I know we were speaking about, you know, many of the, the, the downfalls of being in digital spaces as Black women, but I think in recent months, I've been really encouraged by the work of individuals such as Aziza Johnson and the Healing Justice London work that's coming through and the ways that Black women are creating spaces of care and, and spaces of community and collective organising and prioritising the needs of those who are most marginalised as part of how they um, come together online and provide spaces where people can work on healing and being and finding peace that is has always been hard to do and, and maybe especially hard in this particular moment. Um, so yeah, in my, I'm going to speak specifically about um, the context of my research, which is looking at Black women's digital visual culture. And the reason why I focus on um, Black women and visuality online is because of, I guess, the dominance of our visuality and the, that kind of sitting in a space where we are visible yet um, invisible. But also I'm very interested in having conversations that centre black women and black women's visuality that are away from the gaze of whiteness. Um, so how do black women use social media and use different tools online to 
reconstruct and reimagine our visuality and rewrite those scripts as well. Um, and for me personally, um, why do I focus on black women? Because um, like Francesca saying, the creative production of black women is unparalleled. Um, and we can very often see that the black women's trends or black women's, um, I say this really loosely, but black women's aesthetics and um, I guess use of language is something that fuels the internet and drives the internet. Okay, I'm gonna give this a go with my video off just to see if that makes any difference. Let me know if it's... So, um, oh, <laughs> so for me, I think that my um, my interest in particularly looking at Black British people's way of speaking online is because I found that when I was looking at things from like particularly from like a very linguistic perspective, there is a huge gap in the literature. Um, please, someone, I would love to be corrected if I'm wrong because I am very much still looking to go directly into my tits so pipe up if you've got any but I am um, you know I think that there's a lot of really rich ways of talking about how black people present online um, an African-American text so there's you know the work by Brock work by Catherine Steele Knight stuff about like signifying and even just even just take signifying as an example that is a way which the um talk about the way that African-Americans talk. It's like, you know, a really rich way of talking about stuff, including, you know, that's inclusive of AAVE and also um, just the way, uh, I'm not gonna go into it right now, but my point is that there's no real equivalent. And I think that there's a very specific digital way of speaking that for sure is partially a discipline, but also, I think it's really important that we map out the way that Black British people start stuff. So, for instance, one of the things that has been that I've just started taking down from when I was on Twitter, you know, moment mid quarantine where everything was something to both experience and to write down was the whole this you revelation. And I think like moments like that deserve to be recorded. That's something that is so specific and that we are lucky enough to be able to witness its origin and its movement in real time and says so much about the way that we communicate. Uh, it says a lot about black people's archival practices online. It says a lot about accountability, community accountability, and also it's hilarious. And I think that there's just so much stuff like that that is so uniquely black British that doesn't get, um, doesn't get any sort of academic airtime. Definitely. Oh my goodness. Everything that y'all are saying. Um, and Kishi, when you were like, oh, you know, Black women's productions are unparalleled, I wanted to be like, yes. Like, I mean, just, just, I mean, and I know we're in two different contexts and I honor the context that you are in. So please bear with me when I say this, but we see globally how online, how aesthetics, uh, black fishing, um, how people have been revealed that they're not black and, and, and <laughs> um, you know, they're teaching at these prestigious, uh, you know, institutions or um, they're taking language or, 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 or productions offline, that are, like online and exploiting it and receiving capital and money off of it. It's very interesting to see all these different dynamics at play. So um, thank you so much for sharing your perspectives on this. Um, and also the beauty of being online as well and, and the knowledge production that's created in the connections. Um, so thank you so much for saying that. But when Keisha, I was like, let me, let me control myself. Let me, uh, because it's so true. It is so, so true. So let me stop snapping my fingers and, and acting like I don't know. But um, <laughs> yes, thank you so much for sharing. Um, and also, but when you just said black fishing, I literally just found out about Princess Nokia today. Did you guys see that? No, no, I did not know Princess that. Nokia. <laughs> like, has been pretending that they're Afro, Afro and that's oh, awesome. really? Yeah, 
male deus my god wow you learn something new every day man i'm telling you right yeah. now yeah <laughs> i literally found this out about less than an hour ago anyway we'll circle back we'll circle back <laughs> No, and I, I wonder about that in, in the context um, that you're in too, in terms of, um, I mean, I just think this is a sidebar question. Like how have you seen personally like black women's and Breton's knowledge productions like stolen or exploited or, you know, and how, how has that affected you and your work? And also how do you combat something like that? Especially in the digital space where everyone, you know, things are taken so often and so much and like things like this don't happen or come out until later on. So how do you navigate that space, particularly with, with your work? I, yeah, I think there are, we could speak about this for a long time. <laughs> and I think, and um, there's, there, there are so many different examples of this. And I think maybe trying to focus on what's encouraged me this year and, and, over the, the recent years is how many um, black women, black people are coming together in grassroots ways, making use of digital technology to do things collectively that are, they're not in response to white institutions and um, they're to, to reflect on conversations I've had with, with Aziza Johnson again, whose work is just phenomenal and, and I can't um, recommend reading, reading it more, I can't recommend reading it enough um, but to think about the different ways that people aren't simply um, responding to institutional whiteness, instead they're, they're, they're turning their gaze to what they want to focus on. And I feel like whether it's the Free Black University and um, looking at the work of Leading Roots, the, the work that people have been doing to make it clear that we are not waiting to be simply included in white institutions to do the work that we want to do. We're doing the work already. And actually to be able to do the work that we, we want to and need to do for ourselves and for each other, that often involves um, making sure that, that it is not confined to those spaces that have for, for decades, for centuries, made it next to impossible to exist within and to, to, to thrive and to work towards the sorts of liberationist goals that I know are at the centre of the work of everybody who's here today. So I think that when it comes to how digital plays a part in this. We've been able to learn about different things that people are doing in different parts of Britain. And right now, when it's hard to, to travel and, and it's, it's not safe to, I think it's really great to be able to log in and to follow a, a conversation, to see a website pop up, to learn about e-libraries popping up, which are redistributing resources and making information and reading accessible. And I feel like I'm starting to ramble now, but yeah, I, I think, um, with today's conversation, I hope we're holding equal space for both the, the, the precarious nature of digital spaces for black women and also recognizing the brilliant work that um, black people are doing in Britain and often without many funds or the institutional support that um, non-black researchers are often able to access. I just, I'm just here to say I have nothing to add to that. Like, <laughs> I freaking love you, Francesca. You're just speaking truth. Always, <laughs> always. Definitely. Wait, I was, no wait, I've been mulling over something clever, wait a minute. <laughs> yes, right, hang on, let me stop my video so you can actually hear it. So I was, just what you were saying just then about, um, you know, us doing that space, uh, sorry, doing that in these spaces for a long time and it not being necessarily reactionary that's been something that um i've had to think a lot about in regards to my own thesis and you know in the years that uh, i've been doing phd ugh, um i think it's changed quite a lot from the beginning and um you know teasing it into this point where it's no longer centering thing that we can be centered and fine like i feel like my work I would feel like it was like a, doing a huge disservice to my community if it wasn't being read. Necessarily something that I'm doing because I feel like it needs to be in the ivory tower of academia. I'm like it's a dusty book that no one really references or reads. Like I would really like to run all this work. But 
you know, as these are actual things happening right now. And I think that, um, you know, that has been like in terms of thinking about our labor being poached, etc. I think that that's like an important point of reach where you think about your work and its value on its own to that community. So the way that my work started is that I was interested in, and this is still, this still does play a part in it, but I was mainly interested um talk about the white other and how in like spaces we talk about whiteness and that was I think quite like a narrow and limiting force for my work whereas now I'm very much like what do you talk about full stop and how do we do it how kind of like linguistic things are within these sorts of spaces and you know if white people come into that then they do but if they don't they don't I think that was important through in terms of how I think about our work and the value of our work and the value of doing this work outside of the institution too. So even just things like this, this kind of chat, um, academics that I really admire, I think that I've done most of my best learning at a kitchen table with Keisha and Cheska, you know? Um, and so that's the, that's the kind of stuff that, yeah. yeah page dedication to the thesis but <laughs> which I tell Jessica like every day but that, that's like that's where most of my work exists because it's about us and not so much not our work in the institution at all yeah I love I really love that you said that um I've had quite uh conversations with um my colleagues and friends about particularly in the digital realm like if the government were to shut down digital spaces altogether, which we can see that there's this movement towards, um, particularly with uh, Trump shutting down TikTok or wanting to shut down TikTok, for, for example, what do we, what would we have? And the question was, we have each other. <laughs> and so, um, you know, just hearing how y'all really love on one another as friends and, and, and having these discussions is also really important too. Um, and whereas the digital space is obviously super important because it's where people share across diasporas, across, you know, language, across all, all these sorts of borders and boundaries and, and dismantling binaries. That it's so important uh, to have that community. And I can hear that uh, camaraderie and friendship uh, between y'all. And that makes me very happy to hear. Um, yes, it's just really great. Um, and also too, uh, just navigating and recognizing that how um, the academia is also very exploitive as well. You know, it's like a very, it's a vehicle for exploitation. And we've often seen how um, black women will get in these positions and then they'll exploit their work and then push them out or not pay them enough or not give them tenure. I mean, like all sorts of these, out, these elements. So the work that individuals are doing, black women are doing, um, and especially on the, in the digital space, but off the digital space as well, our digital publics is so important um, because we really don't need academia per se to, <laughs> uh, most of the people I, I admire are not in academia. And so I think that's also important as well. Um, and also if, if, I know Francesca, you talked about it a little bit, but if you all could just please um, provide some examples of black women uh, who are doing amazing, um, work in the digital spaces as well. And so um, people can know more about their work and follow them and, and share and all that jazz. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 of course I was gonna say Keisha and Rihanna, <laughs> it comes straight to mind. Um, and there's, there are so many different people and I know there are questions and conversations in the chat box asking about possible reading lists and resource lists and and um, we'll be providing those as well so you know that there we could spend hours naming the many different people who who we're thinking of but I'm also thinking of Chris Ose who's doing brilliant work to do with and um, black fashion and aesthetics and the experiences of black women when they view the um, series in African City and um, in, in different parts of the US and the UK and um, specifically Washington DC and, and Ghana and, and London and there are are lots of people again doing this work outside of institutions so when I think of different groups or collectives doing brilliant work there's Rooted Scene 
who do fantastic work that in particular programs the experiences of black women and black people in the um, in Liverpool and, and different parts surrounding there in England. But as I said, I, I, I won't keep going on, but we're definitely going to be providing information about different people and different groups. And there are several articles I was thinking of when we were speaking specifically about academia, knowledge production and extractive um, dynamics. So I was thinking about a really great piece, um, which is throwing our bodies against the white background, which is by Aziza Johnson and it's open access. And that'll be included in the reading list. And I was also speak, um, thinking of a, another fantastic piece of writing, which is sometimes clocks turn back for us to move forward and um, reflection on black and indigenous geographies by Nadine Chambers. So yeah, there, there, there's just so much fantastic work that's happening. And as we keep saying, you know, it's, it's not about waiting for institutions or, or others to just acknowledge that, but I think finding ways to share that between each other and to be in conversation so that this work is not static and fixed um, and it's an opening to more questions and, and, and more dialogue and, and working together in different ways. Yes, I mean, we do have that uh, big reading list coming, which uh, Chester's so helpfully put together. And Keisha and I, I guess I really want to shout out a really lovely piece that um, a lovely piece of like video media that I wrote a review of recently called Greatish, the Gaslighting of a Nation by Deanne Crooks. And it's a really lovely digital piece of work about um, COVID and also Windrush and also the gaslighting of black people in Britain by this country um, over a period of, you know, obviously hundreds of years something great to look out for. Um, it's under film and video umbrella and I'll pop it in the chat later. It's yeah, on the cusp of being published, but do keep an eye out for it, it's lovely. And I'd like to plug a few um, social media pages that are doing um, really important work. Um, but again, I'll add these to the list or I'll write them in the chat um, a little bit later. So these are three Instagram pages. Um, there's Tolls of Benny's multimedia project um, called Black British Nigerian. Um, there's Lisa Anderson's curational project and Instagram page, um, Black British Art. And then there's a new one that I found today called Bumpkin Files, which is about um, black history um, from the decenters, um, the London narrative or the London centric narrative. And that's by Carrie Spumont. But I'll add those into the chat. Listen, like this is y'all teaching us out here, please. Thank you so much. Um, and like I said, like, and like everyone said, there will be a reading list. So please be patient with us. And yes, promote yourself, Rihanna, promote, like drop, drop links. You, you better, you, this is what you need to do. Keisha, Frances, please promote your, your work. And, um, I'll be dropping links in too, because this is what this is about sharing, um, the work and, also to not becoming gatekeepers um, of, of the work as well, which academia is known for as well. And, and I just really want as many people to know that, and also to not confl conflate black feminisms with US North American centric uh, uh, people and communities and women, and that there's black feminisms, black digital knowledge productions, all sorts of uh, black political thought and behavior being enacted and catalyzed around the world. Um, and speaking of that, the next section, which I would like to discuss um, on the future of Black women in Britain and digital organizing. So what are your hopes for the future of Black women in Britain's digital spaces and lives? Um, and how do you think Black women's engagement with, di with digital spaces will change or advance in the future? Can anyone hear me? I completely uh, lost uh, that. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, no one here. I was like, we're having technical difficulties. It's all right. <laughs> I was so scared for a second. I was like, did I lose them? Um, white supremacy be gone from the digital era. Um, anyway. <laughs> okay, y'all, let's do that. So <laughs> the next section. Um, is on the future of Black women in Britain and digital organizing. Mm -hmm. 
And so what are your hopes for the future of Black women in Britain's digital spaces and lives? And how do you think Black women's engagement with digital spaces will change or advance in the future? Yeah, I'll, I'll keep what I have to say pretty short, although I, I have a tendency to say that and then <laughs> go off. But I think one of my biggest hopes is just, and, and I'm not sure how this will or won't be achieved, but figuring out how those experiences can be less harmful and less taxing. Um, and to also, uh, what I'd like to see more of is, and, I, and we're definitely seeing more of this, but more conversations to do with the specifics of different experiences in different parts of Britain. And um, so I, I was born and spent most of my life in Scotland. I'm now based in Wales and um, I've got family who are Welsh. And I'm really interested in just how the different places we're situated in within Britain can involve so many different, um, you know, diff different realities that are sometimes sort of flattened and disappeared when we when we speak about Britain, but we're not specific in terms of recognizing where within it, um, and, and also what it means to to move with move within Britain yourself. So whether you're a um, black woman based in Bangor in Wales who experiences moving to Leicester in England, Glasgow in Scotland, Belfast in Northern Ireland. I'm really excited to see more conversations online about the different ways that black women are collectively organizing at local levels, but also in conversation with each other to do stuff um, on, on a broader scale and to also just ensure that the, the lives and history of black women in Britain is um, you know, archived in meaningful ways that recognizes both similarities and differences. It wasn't that short in the end, but I've stopped now. No, it was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, do you want to go, Keisha? Uh, no, you can go. Your signal's good. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, I, rough. I, I, um, I guess definitely double down on everything that Jess just said. I think that the way that we're very London centric about, you know, I say as you know, lifelong Londoner, that the, the way that we're so London centric when we talk about um, blackness in Britain is just really detrimental to the research. Um, think that we would have a more robust uh, like frames of comparison like I think that it would make a lot of our work a lot more rounded I also think that um, I would love I kind of briefly touched on this before but I would love to see um, some really strong critical material or some new people talking about actual Black people speak because I kind of feel like we got MLE and then just stops <laughs> you know we don't beyond like multicultural London English like I don't hear that much and I've I'm not a linguist but I've spoken to a lot in in sense of just go excuse me can you help me and no one's been able to yet so I'm waiting to see um, a sort of more robust way of talking about linguistics that works for the internet us uh, you do a lot of the work of attributing and crediting people who innovate new terms because there's some things that we do and say that spread like wildfire and spread and there's no real there's not an easy way to track that there's not an easy way to sort of scrape that kind of data and be really careful with an archive and be careful with um, and be able to sort of track and record our own histories and I would like to see um, more of that being done because I do find that when it does happen it's usually black people archiving themselves that we have a very strong history of wanting to lay down our own roots and sort of um, like what you'll find is I'll be first talk about it with the back saying, hey, you didn't credit X, Y, Z. So when we're thinking about, for instance, the best example of this would be On Fleek by Peaches. And when businesses and corporations started using um, On Fleek badly, and everyone was like, excuse me, can we make sure that Peaches gets her coin? Like, how dare you not attribute this to the that stuff with like happening with like the renegade dance and things like that on TikTok where people are so delighted to finally see people have their work um, credited to them and we see you know the benefits of that but also just from like an academic perspective it's really important to have 
um, those kinds of paper trails, <laughs> you know, understanding who made what and where it came from, so we can like, uh, you know, comprehensively track it spread and things like that. So I'd, I'd like to see a lot more people respecting the sort of cultural creativity and the sort of critical productions of black people and particularly black people in the UK because obviously this is a very anglophone centered discussion and I'm well aware of my limitations when it comes to thinking about other parts of Twitter. I don't speak any other languages. So you know French Twitter is, an, is a mystery to me but like it looks looks various, looks gay. <laughs> but I'm not part of it. You know what I mean? So I can only talk to our experience. But I think that there is real damage being done by all of our analysis and all of our thoughts being centered around the sort of cultural homogeneity that is um, like African American Twitter. And I'd like to see more variants in it and not just London. Yeah, um, and just picking up on um, both of those points. Um, between the two of you on citation. Um, citation practices, whether that be in our work or just even if it's in conversation with one another and making sure that we know about um, one another and that we are constantly, um, I guess it's a, it's a collective really, isn't it? It's a collective practice. Um, it's a conversation of practice. It's a, it's a dialogue that we need to continually, continuously have about where things are coming from, who's creating things. Um, and just in terms of like, in like, I guess in the academic world, I just want to really plug um, Francesca's book as well, which has some, it's just such an amazing um, citational practice. It's really inspirational. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then on terms of like, in terms of the future, I, okay. Of course, in this con like contemporary moment, this isn't as available or isn't feasible right now. But more of that um, exchange between the online and the offline and more um, in-person um, gatherings and more in-person meetups as well. And another thing that I've been thinking about is the rise of fall and fall of um, projects that appear online, but then they are gone within like a year or two, whether that be due to not having support, um, particular well, whether it's to do with like finances, whether it's to do with um, not having support from institutions, whether it's to do with um, algorithm bias, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's um, a real beauty in the ripple effects of um, certain projects, whether they are just small for that moment, and they might ebb and flow into other projects. And we might see the ripple on effect there. And I think that in and of itself, um, I guess that could in a, in a way be kind of a citational practice where we are constantly learning from one another, um, building on one another and not all the time building for something that will last five, 10, 15 years, but building for something that is needed in the now. And then we are constantly um, in conversation with one another through our projects and through our creative production online as well. Understand when it's just one long goal, one long um, collective piece of work. Yes, I love, really love everything y'all said. Um, people are like on Twitter, like like retweet, like quoting y'all and and saying yes, yes, yes to everything. Um, and I think what was so important about, about that conversation, um, decentering London and why everything is so London centric um, and also to citational practices and the violence of also having um, certain uh, conversations in a certain language and not being inclusive of or discussing or considering other languages, which is something that um, Black Men Radicals definitely wants to work on too, because uh, we can't have this very English centric, <laughs> um, um, Anglophone centric conversations without engaging um, black people who do not do not speak um, the language we're speaking now. So I thank you for for sharing that. And also, I'm very quite interested. Um, this is like a personal question. Why do you think when we why is everything so London centric? Um, because I find that to be a lot, even in the histories that are shared about uh, black people in Britain and whatnot. Like everything is goes towards London, and someone had to 
sit there and explain to me, well, you know, there are people outside of this context. And I was just like, yes, I do know. But then I just sit with it because everything, most of the things that I've read have been in this certain context. So how have you all, why is that? And how have you all broken that or tried to decenter that context in your work? Um, I'm gonna let the other two rightfully drag us, but um, <laughs> first of all, uh, just gonna say that London obviously has, it does have large people in the UK, you know, the, the main part of it, but uh, I'll, I'll let them get to the rest. So I'll just sit quietly. <laughs> so I'll start by saying no dragging is about to commence. Um, I think, and, and it's important, you know, we, we are, we're speaking, understandably about the need to um, you know, recognise the lives of Black people in different parts of Britain and the knowledge production that's occurring there and the work that's happened for, for so, so many years. Um, but at the same time, it's also it's equally vital that we recognise you know, how many Black people live in London and have lived in London for generations and how much incredible collective organising Black feminist work um, has come from there and continues to. So I think what, what's tricky is, you know, it's kind of like the diaspora war stuff. And um, I feel like there's space for us to have these conversations in a way which says it, it's, it's the last thing we're, where any of us are trying to do is, you know, fight for the one slice of pie and this, this sort of like scarcity complex in terms of there should only be one part of Britain who gets to speak on, on this or, or it's, it's somebody else's turn. I think for me, it's more about how can we, speak about the fact that black people in Britain all experience anti-blackness, different forms of um, intersecting structural oppression, whether that's shaped by um, homophobia, transphobia, colorism, but at, at the same time, their experiences are impacted by the power dynamics that exist between nations within Britain. And the reality is capital cities in, in any place are, are obviously gonna have a different type of influence within that environment. And also when we look at the history of the relationship between um, you know, England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, there's not enough time for us to get into that right now, but it, I think it's really, really helpful for us to acknowledge that the colonial legacy of, of Britain um, is, is impacted by the dynamics that exist between the nations within it, and as well as what Britain has, has done to, to so many places outside of it. So to sort of wrap that up and try and, try and leave it with a sort of neater takeaway message, I think it's about considering how the lives of black people in different parts of Britain are connected, um, but also are, are very different because of regional politics, the, the different ways that certain parts of Britain have more socioeconomic power um, and, and much more of a global influence than others as well. And what that then means when it comes to how we engage with knowledge produced by black people and which black people and where um, do, do we tend to, to overlook or, or tend to even erase as part of the ways we speak about black history today. Like, Keisha, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? I thought Francesca's was like a really beautiful, <laughs> really beautiful close. It just felt really natural <laughs> to end there. It really did. I was like, <laughs> yes, yeah. we're dragging, but I was like, yes, yes, yes. Snatch his braids, no, I'm kidding. Um, anyway, <laughs> no, I would thank you so much for that, for that context. Um, and yeah, everyone's saying so powerful. Um, thank you for sharing, sharing that. Um, and also too, is, are, if there's any questions for the panelists, please feel free to type in, in the chat box and while I will ask and the panelists will provide their amazing wisdom. Um, and I think another, someone asked and I cannot find it, but also to connecting um, the work that is going on to the larger diaspora I mean, and, and across, like, you know, the diaspora. And so how do you, how has, Black women's productions and transnationally in the diaspora influence your work? Um, and how would you like for Black feminists like myself, particularly in the US to further build solidarities and to engage your work? And how can we do that? And how can we um, decenter um, ourselves? Because I think people sometimes don't consider nation um, and where we're located uh, a lot of times and, and the privileges that we do have in, in these certain spaces. So 
if you, if you didn't mind sharing that and your thoughts on and your opinions on that question. Yeah, so um, my research specifically looks at the, the way that black women curate digital diasporic intimacy online. Um, so by that, I'm looking at these moments of joy, these moments of happiness, these moments of love, um, whether that be expressed through memory or through the body or through how we learn about one another, um, living in different countries and having different experiences. Um, so while it's very important to acknowledge um, the place that diaspora wars have online, I think there's a, there's a, a really um, rich conversation to be had around that. I choose to center these, these kind of, I guess I'm gonna call them pleasure practices of black women online that really come from um, black women um, from around the world. So let's take the um, black girl magic hashtag, for example, there was so a couple of years ago when I was started this research, I found that a lot of selfies were being um, posted online by black women all across the globe from all, all across different continents. And I was trying to think about the way that something that yes, started within, I guess, um, a black American digital public was kind of used to kind of galvanize a kind of global um, or transnational black feminism there. And I'm trying to think about the ways that black women use images to uplift one another um, across different um, diasporic spaces. And um, I guess engage, connect and learn from one another. But that isn't without having that conversation of the role that um, capitalism, commercialization and like neoliberalism within these platforms has to play on how intimacy is structured and intimacy is achieved. Jessica, do you wanna? Yeah, does anyone else? So I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, and I'm the one who brought it up. <laughs> but <laughs> hang on, let me turn the video off. And I'm the one who brought it up, but also I'm not to, to ask, I don't know. It's not the, I, I, it's not the, uh, I suppose, I suppose in conversations about, I think what will be, that we're having conversations about digital blackness that we just um, nurture specificity. That would be, um, I think, I think also there's a lot of room. I think the um, cultural hegemony means that we have a very detailed understanding of everything that's happening in America culturally, politically, socially, also aware. And it doesn't often feel like that relationship is reciprocal, but I'm not sure that that is like for me to turn around and go, well, let it be reciprocal. Cause also like, you know, whatever be thing. But I suppose that when it comes to just talking purely about the research from a research perspective, it's kind of useful to sort of have these discussions. I mean, if you're not a part of, I suppose it also comes down to who you follow online and where you're sort of based and where your interest is based because to be honest a lot of what I am interested in looking at and what I have been looking at is these sort of conversations that happen on a diasporic scale like Keisha does like you know on a global diasporic scale so one of the things that I wrote about most recently that I'm currently editing into a paper that will fingers crossed well, that I'm applying to go into the DHQ is that I'm writing about um, Wash Your Legs Gate from last summer, you know, about uh, who does and, and or doesn't wash their leg on the And the thing about that conversation is that I'm aware that from where, like, so I was trying to use, uh, well, I was using Brock's CTZA, a critical technical examine not just what was being said on Twitter but also the the space that it was being said in and one of the things I should probably god I'm gonna to have to remember to write this down afterwards but I think my perspective as a researcher 
of what I access when I'm looking at Twitter and what I'm able to access when I'm scraping Twitter or, um, or when I'm, you know, collecting my data. I'm seeing what I see because of the networks that I follow and because of those sort of, we have these really densely homophilic networks anyway, where everyone in it, you know, where we're in these groups and we're black. And yes, I think that's a really great point. Someone's just mentioned what role does age, um, what role does age play? So like my following network, you know, the people who I follow, probably in a reasonably similar age, mostly black. Like that's, that's what I'm following, that's what I'm seeing. So how does that impact the work I'm doing? How does that impact the data I collect? How does that impact, you know, what I'm seeing anyway? So conversation about making, you know, about specificity, how we talk about race and culture, it, or ethnicity, it, comes with the territory depending on what you're following and what you're researching anyway. Sorry, that was a bit of a ramble, but I'm still thinking through it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Francesca, did you wanna jump in too? Um, I, I don't, don't, don't think I've got much to add, but I, I just think, you know, I see all the comments and questions coming through, which are, are all incredible. And, and I'm hoping we have time to get through um, lots of them. But the, the great thing is, you know, we all want this conversation to, to just be a continuum of, as what Keisha said, this sort of ongoing collective work. But I think as well as thinking about um, age and, and generational differences, something that I'm, you know, hyper aware of is how if you're based in a more rural area um, or if you're not able to, for different reasons, access, you know, um, certain technologies or strong Wi-Fi, how that really limits which spaces you could be a part of online or how often you could take part in different types of digital discussions that we're speaking about. So I think, you know, it's what's quite nice right now is we're, we're, we're discussing these sort of um, global, and, and I, I'll, I'll put that in inverted commas, because again, you know, to return to Rihanna's point, I think nurturing specificity is really important, but we're talking about these different digital diasporic dynamics, but at the same time we're saying actually bringing it back to like local, regional, or what might be referred to as national levels is really helpful for us to um, center different people's experiences in ways that involves like substantially understanding the history and geocultural context that they're within, and the fact that Oftentimes we, we speak about, say, the dominance of Europe and the dominance of North America, understandably, but even within those vast spaces, what's going on in, at, at, in, in different countries, in different regions, that is impacting how Black women and how Black people live and whether or not they're more likely to be in a predominantly white space um, or a space where there are other Black people, which might mean that they are, are less in need of some of the digital diasporic spaces that some Black people really go in search of and cultivate. I think, sorry, just to add on the back of that as well, um, I think as well there's this need to really interrogate what is meant by digital blackness and, and what exactly we're talking about. So I just want to plug uh, my friend and colleague Mutsa, who's lurking in the comments, who said to me um, sometime yesterday or the day before, either way, a couple of days ago, when we think about blackness, we're thinking about the, the what and the when and the where of blackness. And I think therefore, when, we, when we're having conversations about digital blackness, we really need to interrogate those questions and not homogenize digital blackness to be one specific thing or one specific, um, I guess, perf online performance. So yeah. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that too. Uh, what is digital blackness, the specificity around that and on that. And also just all of your, your points. Um, this is really resonating with everyone and people are like really excited about this conversation. And I hope that the audience definitely explores and interrogates and supports the amazing work of all the panelists and make sure to follow read their work, buy their books, um, to add to our Black feminist practices and canons um, because we need several strategies on how to get free. And so yes, this is one out of a, another amazing or one out of many amazing conversations that I'm really happy to have um, with you all. And um, yeah, so we have a lot of questions. Um, 
And I'm gonna get into one of them, but Sharice McBride asked, um, a question I have is whether you have found shifts in interest or reception toward your topics given the increasing conversations around anti-Black racism. And if you need me to, I can drop the, the question in, in the chat box too. So I think something, you know, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of all of us, but I think something that we've discussed before and maybe have experienced is people referring to this work as though it is just of the moment and, and referring to it in ways that treats it as a trend and sort of spectacularizes it. And I think, you know, we've, we've had conversations about the fact that it's so exciting to see so many more Black people doing this sort of work. And, and, you know, also recognizing that this work hasn't just emerged overnight. It's just often that people who have been doing this haven't been recognized in the way that they should. But I think that at the same time, there, the reality is there are so many examples of institutions trying to capitalize on the work of black people. And um, in particular, those who aren't institutionally affiliated and um, those who, who do not have the resources that, that others who are sort of handed them on a plate because they're not black and they're claiming to look, look at the lives of black people from this sort of voyeuristic so-called anthropological gaze that doesn't involve any critical self-reflection and how their own positionality is entangled in their problematic and uh, misreadings and, and sort of observations of how black people live. So I think without going on a, a full-blown rant, it's been very interesting, let's say, this last 12 months to see different shifts. And I know we all come from what might be viewed as different disciplinary backgrounds, although I know Keisha is really doing great work that is anti-disciplinary in nature. And we all speak a lot about the boundaries of disciplines, which is something we can go into more detail about now or not. But I think, you know, when I think about media journalism and cultural studies and digital studies or um, different critical marketing study spaces as well, there are... Um, individuals and institutions who overnight are suddenly interested in anti-blackness, anti-racism, um, but they, they didn't have the time to acknowledge black, black people who've been doing this work for a long time before that. So yeah, I think a healthy dose of cynicism. And again, that maybe brings us back to the points we were saying earlier on about why it's so vital to not depend on these institutions to, to be able to do this work and to ensure that citational praxis doesn't just lie at the level of and the work that is occurring within academic spaces. Yes, absolutely. Like, I mean, the shifts in interest definitely wax and wane. And I think, I mean, it kind of comes along with the shifts in interest in me as an academic, as a black academic. Yeah, Cheska, you absolutely handled that question. But <laughs> I mean, mainly if we just think about the way that uh, everyone is talking about or was talking about it, resurgence in Black Lives Matter, like the resurgent interest in Black Lives Matter. Black people didn't stop dying. Black people didn't, you know, it didn't, nothing changed. It wasn't like there was a wave of more, you know, more activity or anything like that. It was just the arbitrarily decided to pay attention at one point and then not another. So you can't hinge your work on those shifting interests because white people are very fickle and their interests are very fickle and their memories are very short. And like, so if you're basing all of your stuff on, if you're, you know, if you're doing anything with that in mind, then I don't think you'll ever get anywhere, especially when you think about like Cheska's just mentioned, the sort of disproportionate hiring practices and, you know, when you come out of this degree, it's something that I'm constantly frightened about is, you know, where is my future? What is my future in academia? Because I'm doing something that everyone thinks is incredibly trendy and isn't, um, you know, a traditional, but again, like thinking about that, that conversation about disciplinarity and whether, I mean, Keisha said the other day that she's anti-discipline. <laughs> what was it? Was it anti-disciplinary? And I was like, girl, you better not say that to any, um, <laughs> any hiring people, <laughs> you know, you better pick a discipline to stick. <laughs> but this is the thing, like being, doing the digital humanities does necessarily mean that you're interdisciplinary and hope that that's gonna be a boon, but also if you worry that that might well be something that will disadvantage you in the long run, like where there's actually no home for it. And particularly, I mean, I one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for this event is because I'm hoping that we'll find me other black British people doing work like us, because for the longest time, I've only known Keisha, Jessica, and 
office. And like, that's probably my bad because I'm definitely antisocial. But at the same time, when the, I, I keep running away to America to go to these conferences, these digital humanities conferences, like the one at UMD that we went to, um, oh, I've forgotten what it's called, but it was good. <laughs> and you know, you're finding that these, uh, these conversations are so rich in America. Every time I go, I meet five new people who are working on the same thing that I am. And I feel like there's very few people focusing on actual blackness in, in the, you know, the digital lives of black people in the UK. And I was just hoping that being here would you know, bring, bring together some more people who are doing that kind of work because we need to be networking with each other and sort of talking together about the spaces, the, the gaps and the lack. That is it thanks Brie like this is one of my my favorite Americans that I was just talking about you know <laughs> we were intentionally digital intentionally black at UMD so this you know I just feel like there isn't even an awareness of how much we're missing yeah, I just wanted to add really briefly off the back of that, like Rihanna said, I think intentionally digital, intentionally black was a pretty transformative experience um, for us taking part in that. It was phenomenal. And, and the work of so many, so many scholars and people involved in that, it has been such a source of encouragement. And I also just wanted um, to shout out the work of people such as Sonia Greer and Naya Jones and different people involved in the Race in the Marketplace Research Network, um, which is a network of, of people doing critical work to do with essentially the various ways that issues to do with race and racism manifest in various marketplace contexts. And um, so I, I, I met people involved in that fairly early on in my PhD process. And I know for a fact, were it not for meeting um, other black people, other black researchers and academics, um, including at Google Emajulu and in the UK, and if, if it wasn't for meeting these other phenomenal black people, I, I wouldn't still be doing the work that I'm doing right now. So I just wanted to express gratitude um, and, and also say that, you know, peers at all, all, all sorts of different levels have played a really crucial part in where we are right now. So I think, you know, sometimes academia can reinforce these hierarchies that are really unhelpful, but there is so much, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer support and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge production that happens. And um, so, so thank you to, to Keisha and Rihanna as well, and, and so many other people too. Yeah, and you, of course. Um, but I, I guess we've reached a point where it's kind of full circle because I just want to loop it back to um, what you were saying at the very beginning, Francesca, about that shift to turning the gaze inwards now. And I guess, and guess, I guess that relates to um, this idea of being anti-disciplinary as well. It's a case of, well, no, um, there are different forms of how we can credit um, knowledge or how something becomes credible or reputable. Um, and not only that, but there are, there are ways of talking and thinking and I guess creating that don't have to conform to these particular standards of what we are told they have to conform to. And I guess we're at this place where, um, while we're doing this research in particular and, and me trying to, um, I guess, push back against what the institution is telling me my thesis should look like. It's that case of looking inwards within myself and within my community and drawing knowledge from there, as opposed to trying to make things fit into particular molds that were never designed for us. Yes, definitely. Thank you for, you know, sharing that, um, everything that y'all were talking about. Um, and, and also, I love the fact of like looking inward. Um, and then someone kept at, uh, asked, like, how do we find, we're policed, you know, in our everyday lives, we're being gentr like gentrification is a, a definite reality for Black people globally. How do we find permanence? Um, in, in our ability to produce or in our ability to be, um, or should we find like liberation and moving or all sorts of questions about how do we find permanence in not just being, but also our productions. And so I think that's important. Like you talked about Keisha to go, go inward and, and um, producing outside of the white gaze. Um, and speaking on that, someone asked from our YouTube um, chat about production. So, they ask, what suggestions do you have in starting your own digital project that centers and uplifts Black people, Black culture, and Black experiences? And that goes along with what 
everyone was talking about in the beginning um, going inward. So do you have any tips on that, on how to start digital projects um, that center Black people, Black women? Um, so I'm currently- In terms of like a research oh, project? Oh, 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 no, I was just asking what you meant in terms of like a research project or- no, Oh no, just as a, a digital project um, that centers and uplifts Black people. I don't know if it was anything specifically about research, um, but that could be a part of it too. Um, mm -hmm. Any tips or suggestions? So I think what I'd say at the beginning is any project that um, is attempting to engage with Black folk, we need to begin by really narrowing that down um, because it's, it's, a, it's a very big project to kind of um, tell everyone's story. And there's a need to not necessarily essentialize and homogenize blackness, but really interrogate what it is that I, I want to do. Um, where do I, where am I entering this project? And then also I think ask yourself whether this is something that you are interested in doing because it's um, coming from self-reflection. And the reason why, and self-exploration, and the reason why I say that is because for me personally, when I do start these projects, it comes from self-reflection, that self-exploration, and my own experiences of being in community. Yeah, I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that those things about self-reflexivity, that is going to power a project for a long time. Like, I won't ever stop how Black people communicate online because a person communicating online. So I think that's really important. Um, let me stop with you again, actually. So the other thing, I suppose, is, again, I'm going to bang on about specificity. So I remember my PhD project started with me talking about I think I said some nonsense, like, you know, blackness globally. <laughs> and then I just sort of realized that that was never going to happen. And then it became the black diaspora. And then it became the Anglophone black diaspora. And then it became black Britain, <laughs> you know, because I think it, there, there comes a point where it's like, especially if you're grappling with theory that's based in different places. And a lot of the, the theory that I use is rooted in you know, black feminist, black womanism, um, in like a lot of uh, black digital discourse studies that do come from the States. And if you're sort of, and that's a super applicable, but if you're grappling with something that is too big a project that, you know, is, because there's so little, that there's so much to look at when it comes to us, there's so, so much fresh ground to, to tread. Um, it makes, it, it can make you a little, um, I don't know, you get, I, I, I personally felt a bit greedy, like I wanted to write about everything, and every time something interesting happens, something I care about happens on Twitter, I'm like, oh, got to write a paper on that, and it's just, you know, there's not enough time in the world. So, you know, me starting with the specific, like, or getting to the specific, constantly trimming away at it and thinking, you know, am I actually capable of doing this? Am I going to do this justice? Like this big broad, am I going to be able to do that justice? Because, you know, there's so much to look at and there's so much material. I think I saw earlier as well that someone messaged about how, um, what is it, about what platforms we use. And I just want to say the digital platforms my work focuses on are Twitter and Facebook. It started off being just Facebook because I started doing like planning my application and all of this stuff that I started doing was back when Facebook groups were really rich. Um, there was a point where there were all of these closed um, Facebook spaces where like just for every reason and you know loads of like it wasn't I mean just the ones that were I was um, an admin of a group called Race Matters, which was like 11,000 strong. And it was talking about um, the group called Face kind of. And I was where my interest sparked. And then afterwards I noticed, I kind of noticed that people were moving away from using those spaces and I got interested in platform. And that's kind of where, where, where I ended up and why I'm now looking at 
sort of like migration between those two spaces and what it means to speak in different places with different observers. So that's just that's just me answering that question. Um, I just want to add again really quickly on the um, the whole starting the digital project aspect is don't feel um, like you have to start something that's going to be so big and so vast so quickly. Let there be beauty in the smallness of the project and the youth of the project as well. Um, I don't know whether it's something that you're thinking of doing by yourself or with a group of other people, but um, Jessica can add to this, there's a lot around like the labour of black women that are undergoing these projects. And I think it's really important to nurture things as they're quite small and tend to things and just be, I guess, I guess find pleasure and beauty in the smallness of the project first. And another thing that I do want to add is um, look and see what else is out there before you begin. Um, I have learned myself by starting projects that there are things that are very similar that sort of being done that I could actually have been in conversation with. Um, and really find power, not only in the, the, the smallness and the youth of projects, but being in conversation with um, other people that are doing similar things, because there's that, it's that whole beauty of the collective and the beauty of the citation and the empowering one another and the care. Yeah. And then on the question about platforms, the platforms that I look at, because I'm thinking about visual, is Instagram and YouTube. And I kind of dabble a little bit in Twitter when I talk about um, memes and GIFs, but that's not necessarily about the platform itself. It's about the images and what they look like and what, what looking at these images does. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just really gonna echo all what's already been said. And one of the first things I was thinking about, which Keisha's just mentioned is that it, the place I'm at right now anyway is there's so much brilliant stuff that is coming through or has been happening for a long time and I'm thinking a lot more about how I can try and support existing work and to um, yeah you know pause and think you know is this idea that come that is coming up something that is maybe already happening and, and how can we you know collectively combine the work that we're doing so that it strengthens what's already in motion and I think also sometimes there can be real worries about the longevity of projects. And, you know, of course we want to be able to archive things. That's, that's really, really important. But I also think that we can recognize the beauty of sometimes short term or, or fleeting or ephemeral spaces as well. And also when we're dealing with digital spaces or digital projects, questions around to what extent do you want it to be public or private whilst bearing in mind, you know, how much is that really within our control when we think about how these platforms operate and, and who's behind them. So I know that I've had some really great conversations with um, Jaleesa Renee Wells, who does fantastic work, who's um, sadly no longer in, in Britain, um, but it's at University of Kentucky right now. And we've been having some ongoing conversations by post and um, online. And we've been exploring different digital, potentially what could be a digital project, but it's been pretty much private to us up until this point. And we've had lots of really great discussions to do with and um, to what extent would we want this to be visible and how might the visibility of that work change things and um, so yeah I think just echoing all what's been said and emphasizing you know looking at what's out there how that can be supported and also being very real when considering the the grief that can come with doing some of this digital work in digital spaces that were not set up to uh, prioritize the health safety and well-being of black people. Wow, I feel like I'm being dragged, Loki, to be honest with you. Like with everything. <laughs> I was like, oh my, this is a testimony to my life right now. Oh my goodness. Um, no, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, because with everything you all are saying, because these these spaces were not created to um uphold or center our mental health, our emotional health, our well-being. Um, and I don't think that people really um, understand the time, the, the energy, the, the money that goes into these projects so it can be accessible. And then also the backlash that people get, particularly black women get for, for doing this work. Um, and like I said, I'm not centering myself, but um, I just felt that heavily. So thank you for, for, for saying that. Someone else had an excellent question. Um, Dulcie uh, Pedroso, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name incorrectly, 
um, but they wrote, thinking about concerns about algorithms and social media, again, in popular consciousness now, thanks to the Netflix social dilemma film, can you say a bit more about how you see these themes impacting Black women specifically? And I think they're more talking about algorithms and, and social media um, and how they impact Black women specifically. I can drop that question in the chat. Does anyone want to take that question or have any? Um, yeah, so I'll take it with yeah, um, I... one example. Um, so some of my research is looking at um, Black women selfies on Instagram. And to do this, um, it originally began as my research on the Black Girl Magic um, hashtag, but essentially it turned out that that was just a method for me to have a look through these um, selfies. And over the years from following that tag, I have seen how, um, because there's, the, there's a difference of actually going into the black, hashtag Black Girl Magic archive on Instagram, but also following that hashtag and having um, the algorithm send stuff onto your feed. And over time, I watched as the algorithms were sending more advertisements via the um, hashtag, um, more non-Black women posting selfies, attempting to get their... Um, have their posts reach reach a wider reach um, because of the popularity of the tag on Instagram and how it's become um, kind of absorbed into this like neoliberal machine. I literally sent a tweet out about this earlier. So I'm literally just regurgitating what it was that I said. Um, so that I just wanted to leave that example is how, which is basically on like how there's black girl magic on Instagram how is it not really serving the purposes that it intended to originally um, because of the way that the algorithm set up and how it prioritizes what it is that we see and who it is that we're engaging with. Um, and that tends to be a lot of ads, a lot of influencers and also non-black women using this space as a way to get more followers. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I just want to signal boost an article that Paula wrote, Paula Akpan wrote for Basel uh, earlier this summer that is a little bit about, um, that is about uh, this idea about how algorithms and so on impact particularly black women and, and black people more generally. So um, the things like shadow ban, that's what she was writing about, about shadow banning and I've also just complete, like literally just written an article um, this week about sort of like the way that these and media and uneven policies, duration, uneven policies about um, hate speech, uh, the way that it disproportionately affects marginalized people. And something that isn't necessarily having attention paid to it by, um, by social media companies but it certainly is something that black people will immediately highlight when it happens and I guess something interesting again about how we tackle things as a community about how we um, as groups self-moderate ourselves online how we um, our internal sort of internal rules on, on like how things are done so for instance earlier when we were talking about um, citation praxis and how certain people sh um, you know, how black people push for crediting um, the uncredited so with the case of peaches peaches etc the same thing will sort of happen when we see that kind of injustice happening so like two days ago when Trump first went into hospital with covid and people were saying like oh hope he doesn't come out etc um and took that time to post and say that violates our twitter rules and that that will um potentially lead to a ban etc it might lead to you being removed from using twitter and a lot of people quite rightfully called out twitter is often silent when it comes to um, the protection of black women we were given death threats every day and it never like comes down to 
been an issue of now it violates our practices. So it's just like very interesting stuff about um, sort of who slips through the cracks when it comes to things like shadow banning, whose content is seen as in prayer, who's like especially this, uh, shadow banning is obviously a huge issue on Instagram. So thinking about the um, the way that different body sizes, shapes are policed. So um, really obvious example that female, you know, certain nipples are allowed and certain nipples aren't. And then also that um, large, like fat bodies will be censored faster. Or, you know, fat bodies showing skin is indecent on Instagram, but thin bodies showing skin isn't a problem. All of these kinds of inequalities that do tend to affect first. Oh, thank you very much for popping that article in there, Cheska. So, yeah, I think that there is um, something to be said about that kind of issue, those concerns about algorithms and social media. And these things will impact us First and foremost, often first in the firing when it comes to things like this. And it's kind of up to us at the moment to campaign for our own fair treatment online. And you do find a lot of people you know, taking that on themselves first and foremost. Yeah, the only thing I've got to add, which came through as part of um, interviews that I, I did and conversations I had with other black women over the last five years or so is sometimes how algorithms would work on YouTube in ways that would actually help people find more of the sort of content they were looking for. So don't get me wrong, that's me not in any way, shape or form saying that algorithms work for um, black people and, and you know the, the brilliant work of um, Safiya Amoja Noble really gets to the, the heart of anti-blackness and the different ways that algorithms are oppressive. So you know algorithms of oppression and, and how um, search engines reinforce racism is such a, an important book. Um, but I think that what something that is interesting to still reflect on is how algorithms can work in ways that might help black content creators at certain times reach um, audiences that they want to reach or increase the visibility that they're working towards. But the, the huge caveat is, you know, the ways that algorithms operate ultimately um, tend to be in, in very oppressive ways. And just as these algorithms might help a black content creator to increase their engagement or their visibility, they can also be helping um, a white supremacist to do that at the same time. So yeah, I think, you know, when we're dealing with algorithms, the, the picture is definitely not a rosy one at all, but there are also some interesting ways that algorithms might work as part of how content creators try to um, boost themselves or how influencers work to self-brand themselves in certain ways. Definitely, I really appreciate this. This is such a timely conversation, um, particularly about Rihanna, what you were talking about, and everyone, Keisha, Francesca, about um, policing digital blackness and and, and um, I think like last week or so Twitter had accidentally quote unquote like a, um, ooh what was what's the term like they um, deleted like all these accounts and I woke up one day and I saw that black and radicals went down like 2,000 accounts I'm like I know I, I mean I didn't do anything I just woke up but you know you were wondering what was happening and my friend sent me um, how Twitter was going through some glitches and how they accident, accidentally um, deleted accounts, but most of these accounts were leftist accounts. Um, and, and that they spoke a lot about abolition and, and from a, a, you know, a liberatory frameworks. And so who gets to be policed, even with, with Trump, uh, like Rihanna, you were saying, has spewed such hateful speech online, but yet if you say anything about him having COVID-19 and, and um, you know, his, his demise, his physical demise, you will be deleted off Twitter. Um, and, and how is, how is that when black women, I've been called all sorts of names, unfortunately, how is that? Uh, and I can't, and when I, when I reported, it's like, oh, well, we can't do anything about it, just block. But, you know, all these surveilling practices are on offline just as well as online. So it's very difficult to navigate that. And I thank you all for sharing that, um, definitely. And then another question someone asked, I think Rihanna mentioned something about how sometimes there's not reciprocal interest on the lives 
and culture of Black people in Britain from Black America? How can we bridge that gap? No one's wanting to start a diaspora war, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. diaspora wars. <laughs> not what we smoke. <laughs> yeah, I think what I'm going to say is it's less about that that specific relationship. Um, we has got the cam off and everything. <laughs> and, and it's more, I think it, it's actually just, you know, thinking about the different ways that um, because of anti-Blackness, because of colonialism, and um, because of you know, the, the, the different histories that have involved the oppression of black people um, and have also again been shaped by sort of globally dominant um, countries or um, globally dominant continents. Because of that, that's all sort of caught up with global media flows. And I think actually, what's really important for us to do is to not ascribe you know blame to any individuals and I certainly don't think that's what any of us are, are doing and I think what can be more helpful is to think about how the way global media flows work and um, shapes whose experiences tend to be amplified or whose experiences tend to be picked up by international media more so than others um, and I think you know when we have conversations to do with what happens in the US and how it reaches Britain at certain times or what happens in Britain and how it doesn't reach the US. It's that those conversations aren't about, um, you know, certain individuals or groups should be working harder to, to listen and learn about others because we don't want to individualize this burden of responsibility, which is really the impact of um, white supremacist capitalist patriarchy and the way that media flows work. So I think it can be more helpful to, to maybe consider how our use of certain platforms or the places we tend to go to to access content can feed into that or might help us to push against that and to to frame these sorts of conversations in a way that makes it clear um, the the desires is to be connecting in 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 better ways and, and to be learning about the experiences of other black people in in ways that honors their lives and that in calling for that and working towards that it, we're, we're not calling out people, um, but I guess we're, we're questioning why is it that we have to navigate these, these different um, power dynamics in terms of who, who tends to know about what, where that information comes from, and what gaps that leaves us with in terms of knowledge to do with the lives of, of Black people in many different places, and especially I'd stress beyond Europe and North America, because even as we're having this conversation, we're often, you know, centering the, the very dominant perspectives that we're saying we want to see decentered. Jessica, I think you've handled that, so let's move on. <laughs> like, thank you for successfully like evading a diaspora war. We didn't need it. <laughs> no diaspora wars here at all. Can y'all hear me? Hello. Oops. Yep. Yeah, oh. Yep. I can hear you. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. There you go. I'm so sorry. I um, was having a bit, a bit of technical, technical difficulties, but no, no diaspora wars here. I think that's like a very important conversation to, you know, to have because, and you're so right, Francesca, about um, who gets more media attention and why and nation and imperialism and all sorts of things. Um, and I think we should have these tough conversations. I think this is why we have um, these, these events to learn from one another, most definitely. Um, so someone, the first, someone said, B. Thomas, the first time I've seen an event about UK Black women and digital lives was this event, which is why I wanted to be here so badly. I have no sense of diaspora wars. I very much want diaspora connections and sharing. So my question would be how we can keep this going in and out of academia. One of the things I'll briefly mention is, you know, I know we're speaking about the digital, but there's also a lot to be said for, 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 for different, you know, in, in person spaces, although I recognize that different people are able to access certain space and certain spaces and others aren't. And, um, but I think, you know, especially when we're speaking about things like diaspora wars, something that does concern me is the way 
white institutions and white media and um, you know with, with that voyeuristic gaze picks up on these things um, and and tries to participate in conversations that they have no business being a part of and in ways that can again be ultimately damaging for black people so I think sometimes it's about knowing which conversations are, are helpful to have in public spaces and which ones um, might be helpful to have in, in offline environments in a more intimate setting between a fewer number of people and yeah just as we keep saying we're well aware we're far from being the only people doing this this sort of work and having these sorts of thoughts and discussions so I think you know following on from here it's it's just continuing to, to share information about what's going on and connect with different people in whatever way feels most comfortable whilst recognizing that there are many people who don't have access to the type of technology or internet or digital spaces that um, we have been discussing at certain times too. And that's when I also say I think the work of um, Kashana Gray on black cyber feminism has been so incredible. And I've just got my copy of Intersectional Tech as well. And yeah, we could have a, a whole other conversation to do with the importance of black cyber feminism and how that's provided us with words to be able to articulate the sort of things we were looking at and experiencing that we didn't have before. Does anyone else want to jump in? Or I think you may have handled that question too. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's really definitely like learning from one another. And I think all of you all, all of you are at the vanguard of this research. Um, and thank you so much for just being here. And, um, and I'm so happy that so many people wanted to learn and to engage because this is definitely what we really need. Like I said before, we just cannot have one uh, area of, or one strategy. We have to have multiple strategies um, and learn from one another to build the world that we want, to um, have sp safe spaces, to transform um, institutions and structures and dialogues and frameworks. And so y'all are really doing the work and just like all this information being dropped, like, listen, I have a lot of studying to do because of you all. So, um, <laughs> which is a great thing. And, and I'm really appreciative of that. And so um, if there's not any more questions, um, I was wondering if y'all didn't, all didn't mind like plugging any events, any initiatives, any books <laughs> um, uh, that y'all have um, coming out. I know that Rihanna, you posted about an upcoming or a forthcoming article, congratulations. Um, just plugging anything that y'all are doing so people can support. And I will also be um, promoting more on, on Twitter and on uh, Facebook and also Instagram about like your work as well. So, and also the, the recording of this event. So plug away, promote yourselves, uh, pop your collar. No, okay. Okay. <laughs> I think we better start with Tesca. <laughs> so, so I will keep this short. Um, yes, yeah, so, so my, my book, <laughs> The Digital Lives of Black Women in Britain, was published this summer with Palgrave Macmillan. Um, and there's a 20% discount code for that right now. So it's um, $24.99 in, in pounds as a hard copy and $19.99 as an ebook. But there are two open access chapters which will be included in our reading list. And you can also access a PDF of the book for free if you sign up to the Free Black University, which has a brilliant library of wonderful, wonderful resources. Um, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm just continuing to do work on these sorts of issues. And at the moment, I'm working on an ongoing project with Leila Roxanne Hill, who's based um, in Glasgow. And we're, we're doing more work on the lives of black women in Scotland. And of course, now I'm in Wales and um, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm Welsh as well, actually. So there, there's lots of interesting, I guess, conversations I'm having with people and, and explorations I'm doing surrounding black Welsh history as well as black Scottish history. And as we've touched on these different relationships between the nations within Britain and what that means for black people right now and what it's meant for black people in the past. What about your other book, Cheska? <laughs> And yeah, um, I'm also um, co-editor with Akugo Emajulu of To Exist is to Resist, Black Feminism in Europe, which is an edited collection published with Pluto Press in 2019. So there's information about that um, as well. But I, I think it's really important that we've got ample time to speak about the work that Keisha and Rihanna are doing. Um, and I also want to stress that if there's anybody out here watching, you know, that they, they will be 
be um, looking for jobs in the not too distant future. And I, I think, you know, anybody would be incredibly lucky to have them work in their department. And I also want to say, you know, we're all early career researchers, but I will be watching to see the different ways that the, these different disciplines or, or anti-disciplinary spaces um, that, that Keisha's focusing on do or don't recognize the wonderful work that they're doing. So I think we're hoping that today's a little bit of a chance to, you know, just, just further establish the fact that um, Black Digital Studies does exist in Britain, um, or perhaps Black Digital Studies isn't even the term. And, and rather than trying to find language to pin it down, we're just saying this is the sort of work that Black people are doing. And we're questioning whether or not disciplinary boundaries are useful at all. And, and if not, what that means for how we frame what it is we're about and what we're working towards. Love that, love that. These, we're, me and Rihanna are the two um, Francesca Stan accounts here. Definitely two Stan accounts. Yeah, thank you. Um, so <laughs> my Twitter is Keisha's tweets um, and I'm currently working on some writing about um, black women's Instagram selfies and the use of lighting in those. So keep an eye out for any updates on that. And I'm also in the very early stages of working on a project um, with my colleague Mutsa Mendy on um, black girlhood. So we're just going to be a Black Girlhood in Britain, which is going to be a visual archiving project about the experiences of black girls. I also just want to add that Keisha was involved in the fantastic Anticipating Black Futures Symposium, um, which previously <laughs> took place, and there's information about that online and in, in the resources that we'll be sharing alongside this as well. So I think it's important that, like we said, sometimes events can happen and, and people don't know what took place or they, they want to know more about the conversations surrounding that. So it's worth looking into that as well as all of the many other great things that Keisha's doing. and Rihanna did you also um, okay okay yeah <laughs> absolutely fantastic uh, I um check out my web hang on can someone else do it for me I've got so little connection this is awful so okay, Rihanna, I, Rihanna is so doing Rihanna's doing everything. So, so Project Myopia is one of the fantastic things um, that, that Rihanna has co-founded. And it sounds as though there are many different exciting articles coming forward. And there's a brilliant piece um, that Rihanna wrote to do with WhatsApp, which we've included in the reading list that's going to go alongside um, today's conversation. And I think Rihanna posted about another piece that's coming out soon as well, I think, to do with censorship. And yeah, I mean, there, there isn't enough time and enough words to say how much both Keisha and Rihanna have been doing. Um, and again, I think it's important to recognise a lot of unpaid labour that can go into that. Um, and, and also I want to add, I know the conversations to do with the digital lives and research of Black women in Britain, but we also want to say a huge thank you to Jamie for all of the continued work and to see Black women radicals happening in a way that um, is really trying to emphasise these transnational solidarities that we're talking about is really important. And yeah, just a, a huge thank you to all three of you and everybody else who's been a part of today or who's going to listen afterwards. Ah, tears. Oh my goodness, I feel so embarrassed. Um, no, I <laughs> thank you all so much. I, um, I really appreciate all of you so much. I can feel the warmth and, like I said, camaraderie and friendship that y'all have and the way that y'all support one another. And that is also an example of what we definitely need to um, collectively, transnationally, to build these, like you said, solidarities. Um, and I'm just really proud of the work and, and honored to be around such smart, badass Black women. Um, <laughs> I mean, all the time. And so thank you for your work. I can't wait to get my book signed from y'all and don't forget about the little people as you know um <laughs> as you you excel but um no thank you all so much and I'm looking forward to what is to come um people are already like retweet like you should go on twitter and see how people retweeted quoted y'all um promoting your work and so I hope that folks who are in the black digital humanities um particularly here in the US can further connect with you all and, and build solidarities. Um, and listen, thank you all so much. I'm super excited for what is to come. 
And yeah, just keep doing the damn thing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, thank you for creating sure. this space and for applause. inviting us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm so delighted to have been invited. And if anyone like wants to be in touch about any of the work we're doing, we're all very approachable. Yeah, <laughs> and if you couldn't tell already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People doing the same sort of work. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, please do just keep keep in contact, keep in touch, and let's keep these conversations going. Like this has been very warm and yeah and if you find anyone else um in britain doing work like us please put us in connection with them <laughs> send them over so we're not just this little trio please <laughs> we want more <laughs> i can hear like the we need yeah, this we desperation like, get lunch. Yeah. <laughs> we get lunch <laughs> we need so you we get yes, holiday yes. together when this is all over <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all so much. And please contact, yes, we, there's more people out there. Contact everyone. Go see Jamie. <laughs> no, go to y'all, go to y'all. No. No, no. <laughs> you are the experts. No, but thank y'all again. And please be safe out there. <laughs> and looking forward to getting that bag, Brianna. Um, if you have any extra sense on my way? No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I was like frozen. Like, <laughs> well, thank you. It's what she would have wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, and we'll be in touch soon. And have a great one, y'all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>